Welcome to Forever Unbreakable. Uh, I've got Justin Rolane as my guest today. And Justin is a guy that I've known since uh, grade school at some point. Um, I, I want to say probably all the way back to like second, third grade-ish. Maybe yeah, I'm not grade, even so. sure. Somewhere back in back in there in the West Appear education system. Uh, Justin is a guy that, well, I knew him growing up. We didn't know each other to the level that we know each other today. Uh, a little bit different friend groups and stuff like that growing up. So um, it wasn't until we both found a love and passion for running that we um, started to become friends. And now we've probably logged five, six, seven hundred miles together. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, quite a few. A lot of miles together. Right. A um, lot of training runs for Cellcom. Yeah. So it, it's been a it's been a blast. Uh, I love running with Justin. Uh, when we get into the West next, we'll talk about, about some of our joint goals together and some of the endeavors that that he's got going on in the in the running world um and congratulations on the recent pr hey man thanks uh, as well on a marathon so and, and we'll get into that stuff and, and that evolution uh but for justin his his journey in life like like all of us you know as it starts as a kid his journey was a bit more difficult uh than what it than what a typical person should have as a journey much like we learned with christopher uh and with sean robinson is that some people aren't born with the same gifts as other people when it comes to your intellectual ability to to process things. So talk a bit about about growing up and, and what it was like and and the battles that you fought um, growing up and, and what it did to you. Yeah, I don't I don't think um, I didn't really I didn't have a hard life by any means. I still have a great I have a great life. Yeah, and you I have, have a great, great family. life now. Like you've I've always got, had a great family. I've got a great family. I've got great friends. I surround myself with with great people. Um, so I've, Will and I have talked a lot about my story, um, and I've thought a lot about it. But um, basically, when I was in elementary school, I'm not quite sure when it was exactly. I think it was about the third grade. I was diagnosed with um, a learning disability, and it was mostly in mathematics. So from what I understand is I can't, I can't really retain numbers. It's hard for me to understand numbers. Yeah. So an example, example would be um, growing up all the way through basically high school um, when everybody else knew their multiplication tables. In order for me to play hockey, I had to learn my multiplication facts. Yeah, and you loved hockey, man. Right. Hockey is what you live for. But I, the, I had to learn them. I had to learn them every year. I I forgot them. Every year I would forget them. That's crazy. So I had to relearn those multiplication. Still, I still struggle with it. So you're just memorizing every year. Every year same, I had to relearn the, the same, same thing. things. Man, I can't imagine that would. Uh... I just think sometimes that um, I felt like it wasn't important to me, so. So you just forget it. But even yeah. if even if at the time, so like even now when you have to relearn some of that stuff again, and, and I can't do multiplication today because <laughs> yeah. we have right. The, you got the technology. You know, well, now the we technology. have. We were we're always told you're never going to have a calculator on here all the time. <laughs> I guess what we do yeah. all the time have calculators on us now all the time. <laughs> but like back then, I, I remember they made us. You know, they had the chart with like zero through nine and right zero yeah through nine and you had to like fill in the chart you know right. all of the boxes and i remember that being like not being an easy task but once you memorized it that was there it was there it was there like yeah. i never had to go back and rememorize right. it in high school yeah you know even in the initial part of college like i i was able to just remember it right so that's crazy yeah and um that's just an example you know um i have an easier time with certain things um, if there's a process to finding, obviously math, there's always a process to finding the answer, right? Yep. But there's certain processes that I can grasp and certain ones that I, I just can't do it. And um, even growing up now, I think that um, they recognize that people have a harder time taking tests. Yeah. Back then, I don't think they acknowledged that. No, they didn't, they didn't care. Right. Like, I remember because my brother had a learning disability right. or, or still has it right. really, you know, I, you don't ever like lose it. You just have to work harder to get yeah. to the same place that somebody right. who doesn't have it. And even, even to this day, they still suck at, at giving assistance for, for tests. Like he's trying to get a CDL and there's no right. real good assistance for yeah. assisting him during it. And it's like, 
man, give a little help. A right. guy needs it every I once know. and again. Yeah, it's a struggle. Um, I remember <clears throat> I had to take my ACT, and I actually got to take it in a room with, with nobody else in the room. It was just me in a closed room, and I still, I still bombed it. <laughs> but I'm sure <laughs> I didn't. I mean, I was I was lazy too, you know. Yeah. But um, I've learned now that uh, if I want the results that I want, I have to do the work. It just took me longer to figure that out. But yeah, growing up, um, and like I said, it wasn't that it was that hard. I just I got a lot of scrutiny from not only my peers but um, some of the educators as well. Yeah, talk about that because that that same thing is uh, has come up in the past on here about educators not not caring or not taking the time, and and not even not caring or not taking the time, but physically making a, a negative example of you leaving the classroom. Like I look back on on being in those classes with guys like yourself, and they would be like. Oh, there goes Justin, the retard yeah. or whatever, right. you know, like talk about what that did mentally. Yeah. You know, to you at the time. And I hate that. I hate that word, it's but I'm going to, right. But I'm going to use word. it just because I want people to understand, like I was called a retard Yeah. by, um, by my peers. And I remember walking out of a classroom one time to take a test with a, a friend of mine. We were in the same special education class and, um, the teacher said, all right, everybody, wave bye to the SPEDs, meaning special education yeah. students. Coming from the teacher. Coming from like the teacher. Somebody who, and he was, who we trust to right. educate and develop our kids. Yeah, he made an example of us, and everybody waved and everybody laughed. Like, oh, SPEDs. Nobody ever – I never heard that before. Yeah. I never heard that before. No, and that's where it came from. Like, we as kids don't create, you know, a lot of the words we use. Like, we hear it from our parents – or right. somebody, and then we use it. So yeah. a teacher is somebody who's supposed to be like a father or a mother, a, a parental figure, guiding us and developing us into being good human beings. And instead, they were making a negative example yeah. of you and allowing everybody to, to and bully it, you. I don't think I realized that, that it, it beat me down. I don't think I ever realized it really beat me down. That it had to. Like, it, there's no way. When you hear things like that from... I didn't mean to cut you off. When no, you hear good. things like that from people who you're supposed to respect, you start to believe it. Yeah. You yeah. start to believe that you're not as smart as the rest of the kids. Yeah, absolutely. It's somebody you trust. Right. Like, I can only imagine because you take so much to heart, especially at an age like at that. At that age, yeah. I, I was probably 13 or 14. You know, you have you have two kids now and you you know, as you're developing your kids and, and you're teaching your kids things, like when you smash your finger and you swear, the one word your kid, child yeah. takes is the swear we'll run word. run around saying it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, <laughs> so so your child believes you through and through. Right. You know, and that's what we do with teachers, especially at, at a young age. I mean, you started special ed probably in third grade. Yeah, I think I was, in, I'm pretty sure I was in third grade. Yeah, so like a super young age, you're already going to special education. And all of the kids are in class are picking on you because you're the kid in special eds in special ed and a lot of their parents are like hey don't hang out with those kids like right for whatever reason fear or the stigmas and and all that and that's the one thing that like we're trying to do with this platform is kill these stigmas that it's okay to ask for help and to you know educate those who are educating like educator educators like right. it's not okay like what you do to people is it affects very, them, yeah. it, it's got a huge effect. Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, like I said, I didn't have it hard, but, um, I mean, I had a mild, pretty mild learning disability, but, um, compared to others, I don't like to compare myself to other people, you know, and yeah. I don't like to point out other people's, I guess, flaws. Yeah. But, um, I just remember growing up thinking that, uh, I didn't understand why I had to go to the different... I didn't like the fact that I had to go to a different room. I didn't understand why I had to, and yeah. no one else did. And did anybody take the time to, like, explain that to you? I'm probably. You know, but in a... <laughs> probably. But in a method but that I you don't, would... In yeah, a, I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah. I remember it, them saying... 
so specifically. There, yeah, so therefore it probably wasn't in a means that you understood either. Right, that could be it, yeah. You know, yeah, that could I've, be it too, right? I find that being a big thing today is like there's a lot of people say different things, but not in a way that like I can understand it. Right. So it's like going to the doctor's office and they're like, yeah, you got something wrong with your blah, 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 blah. And you're like. <laughs> yeah, right, great. Great. Tell me how you're going to fix it. Yeah, like, right. like what, you know? So uh, the one thing I learned with uh, Dr. Sean Robinson is that like he needed somebody who would take and explain it in terms that he could understand and break things down in a, in a different way because we can all learn the same material everybody can but people don't take the time to teach it to you in a way that you justin could learn you know mathematics because right. there's a million ways to learn your multiplication table right yeah I mean, one of i just didn't work. find that one way right yeah you know and that's like and that's <clears> what they that's what needs to happen you know so like continue on with uh with like the development of friendships, you know, and how, and how that worked for you growing up when some kids definitely didn't want to hang out with you because of that. Well, we were friends. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. We were Um, absolutely friends and we still are today. Right. Yeah. No, um, I don't, I don't, um, I didn't have a lot of confidence. I was real shy. Even in, in high school, I was really shy. I always made friends with, um, Everybody, I think I was friends with everybody. Yeah. You know, I didn't, there wasn't anybody that I didn't get along with. And that was because you were a super nice person. Yeah. Like, once people got to, once I sat down and got to know people and people got to know me, they would think, because I, I played a lot of sports. Yeah. And that was kind of my outlet. Dude, you were great at sports. You so still people, are great at sports. I think people kind of looked at me as this athlete who didn't want anything to do with them. But when I sat down and got to talk to people, like, oh, this guy's, you know, he's normal. He's a normal guy. He's not some jerk running yeah. around thinking he's the shit for playing all these sports. Yeah. So, like, the one thing that um, we learned with Christopher was through baseball, he learned and became more educated and, like, built and developed friendships, lasting friendships. So would you say that basically sports did something similar for you as well? I think it taught me how to build friendships yeah like work as a team and stuff like that right and that's why like some of the best friends i have still to this day i grew up playing hockey with yeah which is you know so i think it's got a lot to do with working in teams like teamwork i think generates the best qualities in an individual right like you've gotta you've gotta find a way to communicate and relate to another player you know, another yeah. person, guy, girl, you know, white, black, Mexican. It doesn't matter. Well, they depend on you. To get exactly. The on, right. Yeah. You know, so I think that it's, I think that there's like a lot to be said for sports and what, or, or group activities and what they bring to somebody's ability to develop and educate. Cause like you said, in order to play hockey, you had to learn your multiplication tables yeah. or you couldn't play hockey. Right. So, like, there was no way that you weren't going to learn your multiplication right. tables. Yeah. Sometimes it came down to the wire. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, like I said, and I got diagnosed with that, and I was always going into different rooms to take all these tests for all my classes. It wasn't just um, mathematics classes. And I had, um, I had a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers that believed in me. Um, I wish I would have listened to them more looking back now and seeing yeah. it. I wish I would have listened to them a little bit more, but it's harder to remember. It's harder to, I think, acknowledge good things, at least for me. Yeah, and you bit. remember the criticisms more than you remember the, the positives, I think, sometimes. Yeah, the negatives always hang with us. And it's right. really hard, especially at a young age. Like, how hard is it to accept criticism and use it to make you better? Like, now... That criticism from childhood now fuels your fire yeah. to go out and prove to people, like, yeah. hey, I can't. I'm not what you I thought will. I was. Yeah. Right. You know, because, like, right now, what are you doing education wise? Um, I am about to graduate with a bachelor's degree yeah. in business administration. With And as of right now, I am, uh, I don't like to brag, but <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, no, sure. As of right now, I'm on the honor roll, so. Yeah, I'm which on is, track, yeah. Which is crazy. For yeah, a, I've got four more classes ed, left. For a kid who was in special education, who so many teachers were like, he's not going to amount to anything. He's not going to college. You know, like, not going to do anything. And now, on the honor roll in college, like, just crushing. So where do you go to college at? 
I go to Lakeland College. Yeah. Are yeah. you doing like online classes mostly then? Yeah, it's mixed between online and um, in class. Yeah, and just crushing. So how's math in college? Um, it's probably I got now. through it. <laughs> <laughs> I got through it. But, but like, what did it take to get through math in college? Lots of studying. Yeah, like you worked. I, and this is not the first time I've been in college. I've been in, uh, I mean, right out of high school. Well, in high school, this is another thing. I was told by my guidance counselor I would never make it into a four-year college. Yeah. My guidance counselor. I can still remember sitting in his office, and he said, you'll never get into a four-year college. He told me that. The person who is supposed to... My guidance to, counselor told me that. Yeah, the person who's supposed to like help you get on a career path that you'll be happy to go to work. That's what everybody right. says, right? Don't go to a job that you're not happy to be at. Right. Like, he needs to... They need to, like, push people to do more. More. Because you can do more than you think you can. Yeah. And you sure as shit can do more than anybody thinks that you can. Right. Like, Because you can go out and you can do it. And you've, you've proven that time and time again that you can go out and do things that people tell you can't. Yeah. That's why you're in college, in a four-year program, and not just in college, not just surviving college, but you're on the damn honor roll. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it feels pretty good. That feel, it's got to feel great to just yeah. stick it to the and guidance I think counselor. That, I think that guidance counselor's retired. I don't think he was very popular, but... <laughs> well, he should have gotten very fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, as soon as I got out of that meeting with him, I went down and um, my special education teacher, I cannot say enough good about her. I wish I could get a hold of her. I really wish I could. Um, my, my parents keep asking me, what do you want to do once you graduate? You want to have a party? I'm like, no, just find that special education teacher. Do you remember who it is? I know her name. Yeah. But, um, I, I mean, she was like my, she was like a mother in, when I was in school to me, you know, she yeah. was, she would dial up my mom in a heartbeat if I failed the test. <laughs> so, I mean, she was always right there. I went back to her and I told her what that guidance counselor said to me, she got up immediately from her chair and marched down to his office and <laughs> reamed him a new asshole. That's awesome. I just squared that away. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and then, you know, not too long after that, I got into a four year college and I took that acceptance letter in to my special education teacher and she did the same thing. She didn't say congratulations to me. She got up out of her chair, took that letter, marched it down to that guidance counselor and slammed it on his desk. Dude, how good did that make you feel? It made me feel good, but then I blew it. I blew co I blew college off. So did I my first go around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is time number three yeah. for me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> I've grad oh well, this will be I graduated once um from college with a certificate at a technical school. Yeah. Um, and then I graduated with my culinary degree. Um which are still huge accomplishments. Yeah, which know? yeah, I'm not taking yeah, I'm not taking anything away from those at all. Yeah, but um, they helped me get to where I am now. Dude, that's I graduated awesome. from culinary school in 2012, um, almost on the honor roll. I was a 3.49. Dang, <laughs> I, I I missed one class and I could only get a C. So what's your GPA at right now? It's right there. It's right at a 3.5. <laughs> Just hanging. I'm on. hanging on, but I think I'm gonna get it. Yeah, that's I'm, awesome, I'm determined man. to get it. So that's awesome. And dude, determination is what got you here today. Right. Like when everybody's picking on you and teachers are calling you a sped and all this stuff, you know, like, and here you are, four classes away from a bachelor's degree that somebody told you you couldn't have. Yeah. And you'd never get accepted into a into a program. And here you are, four classes away, like been accepted into the program, and not just there, but excelling. Yeah, I think I still, I think I have a tendency to still downplay it. Yeah, and you yeah. shouldn't. Like, it's huge. The one thing that I've noticed about the podcast is everybody on here is the most humble people. Like, and they're, and what I think it is, is like they've gotten to the point because it's like I used to be a pretty conceited person. Like, I was like, yeah, I'm good at sports. I'm good at it. I'm blah, blah, blah. The best, best, best. <laughs> and uh, the one thing that I learned is like, as you become, truly actually successful and you put in the hard work that's required to truly be successful you become humble through the process like you learn and you see other people's struggles and you get to experience it and you're at times you're putting yourself in their shoes and their life experiences and i think that that generates this humble side that you have 
where you've struggled so hard to get through school that it's like you you're just humble about it yeah like it's i think it's a lot of like the struggle builds this humility you know this right. humbleness. yeah it's a good way to look at it like it's it's unique it's crazy yeah. to me because like if i were you i'd be and and i'm sure you are proud as hell because you should be proud as hell i mean i'm pr- i'm just uh i think what a, the main thing at this point in my life is i want to show my kids like it's possible you can do whatever the hell you want to do yeah, it's possible because you have no idea if if either of your children have a learning disability. Yeah, but they're way too young. Right. You yeah. Know? But like, in five years, you might find out. Hey, my son has a learning disability. Right. I I can show you what I did with my learning disability. Here's my certificate. Don't do what Here's I did when I was younger, degree. though. <laughs> yeah, and just don't believe teachers that don't that don't believe in you. Yeah. Like, find people. The one thing that's helped me the most in life is I'm surrounded by people that believe in me. Right. And and I believe that you have that now. I do, yeah. Now I do, you yeah. believes in you. Like, like uh, Chad Hawker's always out. You know, you guys are always battling on the run stuff. Yeah. But he, He's slacking, by the way. Is he? <laughs> yeah. Chad, we're calling you out. We're calling you yeah. out. He's probably looking at my numbers like, Will's slacking too. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but it's great to have that support system, you know, like like your wife supports it. Like she knows, hey, this is, this is the end goal. And right. you're getting there, like. Through the struggle, you're achieving the journey. Yeah. But let's uh, let's talk about some of that that struggle on top of that. So you you graduate high school, and, and even in high school, you find out what alcohol is. Yeah. You know, and that leads you down down another road right. of struggle. You know, which potentially maybe led to I know it led to me not graduating college in my first go around. Oh yeah, I, I was got definitely kicked out of school. Why I didn't. Yeah. So <laughs> I went to. I went to Marion College right out of, right out of high school. Yeah. And um, I initially I wanted to try to play hockey there, even though I knew like if I'm if I did make the team, I wouldn't play. But it would have kept me. Do they have a really good hockey team? Now they do. When I first went there, it was just starting. Okay. So they were struggling a bit, but so I thought I had a chance. Yeah. But even then, it was kind of one of those things. Like I was told by their head coach that he was going to be at the state hockey tournament, but he wasn't going to watch me play. Really? Yeah. So he could have watched me play, see if he wanted me to even try out, but he chose not to. I don't know if it was something he saw in me when I met with him. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter. But so I went to college and um, my first year I didn't play any hockey um, and I, I didn't do so hot in school. And then, um, my second year, I did better. I kind of refocused, and um, I found a hockey team. By the, their name was the Fond du Lac Bears, and I played with them. And then they were, um, I, I guess it's like amateur hockey. You okay, know, it's not. Yeah. Um, we would call it a glorified bar league. Okay, <laughs> but um, <laughs> our coach called us a drinking team with a hockey problem. That's awesome. So. <laughs> It was at the time, you know, I was 20, 21 years old, and I was having a blast. Yeah, living the life. Right. No responsibilities. So, you got no kids yet, no wife. Right, but, nothing. I mean, yeah. I was just, well, I had school, but that was just. But you weren't taking it serious. I wasn't. I was yeah. doing better than I did the first year. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, like you said, um, a lot of those guys I was hanging out with, they were in their mid to late 20s, some of them in their early 30s. And here I am, 20, 21 years old partying with these guys, drinking alcohol. Yeah, living the life. Yeah. So, I mean, I did better in school. I had fun playing hockey because I made those friendships, and I, I finally felt like I had a place. And they accepted me. Yeah. They were cool, they were cool guys. So I still talk to a few of them. So you're naturally going to do what, what all of those guys are doing. So right. it's more drinking, more partying, yeah. more whatever they're yeah, doing. Yeah, every weekend you know? it was game on. In yeah. more than one way. We had hockey. But I remember even going, and it's, you know, it's it's embarrassing. And um, <clears throat> it's hard to even talk about. But I would go to games, and I would, if we were on a tournament, at a tournament on the road or something, I would go to games. And I remember one game, we were they were singing the national anthem. And um, one of my teammates looked at me, he said, my nickname was Chuckles. Yeah. He says, Chuckles, you smell like booze. <laughs> I'm like, well, I mean... 
what am I going to do about it now? <laughs> <laughs> so what I did is I kept getting penalties just so I could go sit in the box. Yeah, that's I was crazy. a bad teammate that day. <laughs> and it was all because of <clears throat> drinking before the game. Yeah, before a game. Yeah, like, but I, you know, I wasn't the only one that was just drinking before games. No, but you look at it as like one of your big passions. Yeah, is playing hockey. Right, I kind of lost that focus. And you're instead of worrying about playing hockey, you're thinking, how shit faced can I get? Yeah, I, and still be able to skate. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, because I've been there. Like I've been to so many things where I'm like, how shit faced can I get before this starts? Yeah. Like, I want to be just raged up, ready to party yeah. before this starts. Yeah, my answer was I can get pretty shit-faced. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've done tri- – I remember doing a triathlon um, with my buddy Nick Plokar where we went out in Milwaukee the night before. We got blacked out hammered doing shots until bar closed. We went back to the hotel room, and it's it's now 2.30 in the morning when we get back to the hotel room, 3 o'clock. Probably by the time we lay down in the beds, it's like 3 o'clock, let's say. And – at like 3.05, I look at Nick, because we had to be up at 4 to get to the triathlon on time. And I look at Nick, and I was like, should we just get up and go? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, bro. And I was yeah. like, you driving? And he's right. like, no, you are. <laughs> so we're hammered. Right. We do the stupidest thing you can do, get behind the wheel of yeah. the car and drive down to a race. That's like another 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away. Right. We get in a transition. I'm dry heaving in the corner. Nick's pounding five-hour energies. And I make it like halfway through the swim, and I'm puking my guts out in the water. <sighs> and it's like, what good? Yeah. I love what triathlon. What good comes of that, yeah. I'm super passionate about triathlon. Right. Why would I do that to myself? Yeah. And it's, and it's the same thing that you were going through. It's just, yeah. it's alcoholism. Yeah. Like, it's being addicted to it and the way that it makes you feel. And it just drags your life down. It yeah. wrecks everything around you. I think it started for me when um, I started making friends and all those friends. Um, Party. Right. And it's the, the other thing, too, is even in, sorry, mom and dad, but <laughs> in high school, like, I, was a re- I was pretty shy. Like, we, like I said, I was pretty shy. And then um, if my friends were around and some other people were around, that weren't so close to me, that didn't know me as well, they would be like, man, Justin is pretty fun when he starts drinking. Yeah. And so, so if they tell you, you get that. A, you get addicted to that feeling. Yeah. If they and tell they you tell you're you the that. fun guy. Yeah. Like, you man, know. you're a lot more talkative. You're a lot more fun when you're drinking. Yeah. Yeah. And so you so just, just, just want to do it more. Yeah. And it's the only way that you, you begin to think. I remember when I went through it, and so tell me if this is the same way for you. I began to think that that was my personality. Yeah. That the drunk Will, yeah. you know, or my nickname was Will the Thrill. Yeah. Like that I don't know if I ever really saw Will the Thrill, maybe that, once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> but Will the Thrill was like the guy that I wanted to be. Yeah. So I changed my personality yeah. to be Will the Thrill, the drunk asshole. Right. You know? Like, yeah, I don't think I ever... <clears throat> yeah. I, don't, I would just drink to the point where I would just be passing out. Yeah. But yeah, and then um, you know, that was that was probably I think I was 22 when I said okay, enough so with enough of the hockey. Um <clears throat> and then um I uh I don't really remember what I did after that, to be honest. <laughs> I went to Maine and uh, I was a camp counselor. Okay. Uh, for a summer, and I kind of cuz I was trying to run away from a lot of those problems that I had. Yeah. Um and it worked for a little while, and I made one of the best friends of my life, one of the best friends I have to this day. It's just unfortunate that he lives in and he's from England, but um, <clears throat> um, my life it turned around for a little bit there, and I was making the right decisions. And then I got I got back, and then I met uh, my wife, Chelsea. Um, Love the wife's name. Yeah, Mine's yeah, the same. yeah. <laughs> I think it's spelt the same too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once I got back from Maine, I went right to Madison and um, went to uh, small engine repair school because I wanted to work on motorcycles. I do remember that, actually. Yeah, I was real. I still love motorcycles. I love them, but I can't work on them. I never could. <laughs> well, the same way. Not even after stuff. school. <laughs> I, it was, I was in Madison trying to go to school. So, I mean, yeah. I'm in Madison. Yeah, Madison's I'm awesome. Yeah. All, all the time. All the time. Yeah. And so, obviously, then that doesn't help with the education side. Yeah. Because you're shit-faced going to right. school. And right. I got through it. But, um, 
Yeah, then after that, you know, we, my wife and I, well, she was my girlfriend at the time, we both moved to Milwaukee. And um, after probably a year and a half, she she went somewhere else and I was just in Milwaukee and I was drinking as much or more more 12 probably as close to 12 pack as I could get every night dang were you drinking before work too or no not at that no so there was a time in my life where I would go to McDonald's or wherever right Subway it didn't matter and I would get the cup fill it like half full of soda and then I would go out to my car and fill the rest with like vodka so you like pink lemonade yeah. Vodka. And I would sit at work yeah. starting at like noon because I knew that we were going out at like five o'clock in the afternoon right after work. Right. And I'd be like, I got to be Will the Thrill by five o'clock. <laughs> right. By five o'clock. So I would drink the rest of the work day. Yeah. I would just go refill my cup. Yeah, that's like, not good. In the car. So I remember doing that. And that's why I was curious if you were doing the same thing or not. Um, No, not at that point. Yeah. No. no. But, um, yeah, if, I think if people don't see where this is heading is, I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. So no, I absolutely. get to that point. I get to that point where I stop having fun, and I'm only drinking just to feel what I thought was normal. Yeah, and be able to pass out. I assume. Yeah, yeah, and um, that just came with it. <laughs> I would yeah. just drink until I passed out. Most every time I drank. Yeah, which is crazy. So, and you're just building a tolerance. So, yeah, twelve beers turns to thirteen, to yeah. fourteen. Yeah. So then you just start drinking faster, and you start drinking more, and then you start drinking heavier, yeah. heavier stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, then um, when she moved, I moved back home, and I got a job at a bar of all places. So Perfect, that right? Help anything? Yeah, was this when you were working at the Q&A yeah, or something? Yeah, I was yeah. cooking at the bar. Yeah, yeah. free beer. So Most that doesn't the whole help time I was there. anything. No, not at all. Because then you're able to just sit behind the bar, drink the whole day, probably get in the car and drive home because we're all idiots. Um, well, I, I learned a valuable lesson at one point in my life <laughs> Okay. to not do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I was pretty good with that, but yeah. Which is um, good. I didn't learn that till I was probably like 28 years old when I finally stopped drinking and driving. Yeah. I think when I was 20, it was probably around 23, 24 when I got the job at the bar. And I, it's a lot, it was a lot more difficult to get a ride back then. Not impossible. It wasn't impossible. Yeah, but Uber didn't exist. It didn't exist. Lyft didn't exist. Smartphones like, didn't exist. Yeah, you're right. We had the old flip phones yeah, back then. Yeah, I had the coolest flip phone on the block. <laughs> yeah, the Motorola X or Still whatever no it Uber, was. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Razor, that's what it was. The Motorola yeah, Razor. Yeah, the Razor. I remember when that for was sure. like the yeah. phone to have. <laughs> yeah. So... It's gotten a lot easier. I don't think there's never, there is never an excuse to drink and drive. Never. But um, especially now. But we all made them. Like right. I made it for probably seven years of my life. I made nothing but excuses for why I could and should yeah. drink and drive. Right. Like why I'm, I'm good at drinking and driving. Yeah. Right. A fucking idiot. Ignorance is. <laughs> ignorant. It's Absolute just, ignorance. It's bad. You know. So yeah, I got the job. I got a job at a bar and um, it was all good for a while. And then um, I got. I decided. That's when I decided to go to culinary school. So this is about 2010, I think, yeah. is when I first went. It's a two-year program. I okay. went to Fox Valley Tech for it. And, nice. Um, I remember uh, my my girlfriend, my wife now, yep. girlfriend at the time. She moved back home. Where's home for her? Like East. She's from East Superior. East Superior. Not from okay. West Superior. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, she was. She, um, we could argue that she is from West of Pier. She lived in West of Pier all the way up until high school, and then she moved <laughs> to East of Pier. So she's kind of mixed. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so she moved back, and uh, I was living with my brother, and my relationship with my brother just started going to shit because I would drink all of his booze, and um, he'd come home, I'd be hammered, and we would just fight. We would fight and fight. Oh no shit! Yeah. Your brother's awesome. He's like my your best. Brother's he's a, my best friend. Yeah, he's a super nice, super legit yeah. dude. Yeah, he's my best friend, and I hate the fact that I hurt him like that. But I did because I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't at that time. I didn't think it was a problem. Dude, it's it's the same way that like you see you see drug addicts do the same thing. Like they'll steal from their best friend, right? Because like, they don't yeah. care because they just are looking for the next high. Right. And it's the same thing with alcoholism. It's the same thing. You're just looking for that next drunk. 
Yeah, that consumed yeah. my every thought. Yeah. Is when am I going to get that next drink? Yeah, it's freaking And usually crazy. the answer was at work the next day. Yeah, well, because you're working at the bar, so you right. knew, like, okay, as soon as I get to work, I can get shit-faced. Right. So you're almost excited to get to work. Yeah. It wasn't like, a, it wasn't like work. Yeah. It was like going to Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. All my friends were there all the time, yeah. you know, or I thought they yeah. were friends. Yeah. You know, some you of them still are friends to this day, but Good. most of them, I, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. As soon as you're not doing what, that's what I've learned with a lot of friends is as soon as you're not doing what they're doing, you're no longer cool to hang out with. Right. And it's like your, your true friends, like my, my truest friends. Yeah. I might not see them for a year and we'll go back and be best friends, but they don't care what I'm they care what I'm doing. Right. But I don't have to be doing the same exact thing as, as them. them for us to stay best friends. Yeah. That's my friend in England. I haven't seen him since my wedding and I've been married for five years. So going yeah. on six. Yeah. And talk to him on a regular basis. I talk basis. to him almost on a daily basis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like Sody and I message each other all the time right. and we never see each other. Right. You know, he's busy in Las Vegas and he'll be back home soon. But like, it's, it's amazing how you find out how somebody's your real friend. Yeah, you not. find out who your friends are. Yeah. You find out who they are. As matters. soon as one little thing changes in your life, you find out who your friends are and who aren't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was working at the bar, went to culinary school, like I said. Um, I remember when the Packers won the Super Bowl the last time, yeah. I had a chef instructor that was a recovering alcoholic, and um, I partied my ass off that day. And I got into a huge fight with my, my wife. And um, I went to school the next day. I was pretty, I never miss anything because of my drinking. Yeah. You know, I would always suck it up. It's my own fault. So I went into class and he knew immediately. Hey, I mean, I was. hadn't showered, hadn't even brushed right, your teeth. Like. My <laughs> eyes were bloodshot. I reeked like a bottle. I'm sure of it. Yeah. And um, he goes, you know, Justin, there's other things you can do. And I was like, whatever, <laughs> chef, yeah. you know. Yeah. Didn't matter to me what he said. It didn't matter what anybody said. Yeah, because you oh, you cared about one thing. Just getting drunk. Yeah, the next drunk. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's wild. And then that was I graduated from there in 2012. Um, my my I got a job at um, a well established um, fine dining restaurant in the, in the Green Bay in Green Bay. Yeah. So um, my boss was one of my good friends um still a good friend of mine uh he stood up in my wedding nice um i grew up playing hockey with him okay and even then you know we're at this fine dining restaurant but and i i mean i love the guy i love the guy you know um but we would drink behind the line and it's not his fault you know yeah. it's not his fault if he listens to this don't worry it's not your fault i love you but <laughs> <laughs> um no, we would drink behind the line. And I remember one year he um, gave up drinking beer for Lent, and I, I, like, lost my drinking buddy. But at the same time, you know, every time we got an order for a beer bat or crawfish, the bartender would bring up a beer for us. I didn't yeah. have to share it anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was winning, yeah. So you could get twice great. as drunk. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. It was great. But um, then uh, shortly, I think I was there probably – four years or so okay and then um i got a job at at um st norbert college and um i was still drinking but it was a, i f i felt like it was under control yeah. but it was constant fights uh, constant fights i look back on it um i don't know how my wife stuck with me i really don't this is we were fighting ad all admirable the time. though isn't it that like she must have seen something in me I mean, my family, my are... family, they, they're stuck with me. Yeah. But no, they could have walked away too. But, but I don't think they saw what my wife saw. Yeah. And you know, I was never mean. I never... Um, which is good. I never did. I never... Hit her. Never hit her like ever. That. You know, I rarely would raise my voice because I always knew I was I was wrong. Yeah. You know, I was drunk. And the way I, the, I was acting these ways because I was drunk and it wasn't right. No. It wasn't right. But it was the... What I think she saw, obviously, is the person that you are today. Yeah. And she knew that that was there. She just didn't know how to get to that point. And I wouldn't listen to her. I didn't listen to her. You know, she could have told me, hey, look, you're an alcoholic. Like, you got to stop drinking. I would have said, piss on you. Yeah, I don't I'm care. I'm not. 
yeah. I'm going to go get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make sense. It's not logical. No, exactly. But we don't, it's all too often that we don't listen. You know, I yeah. find myself doing that often when people are telling me, you know, not to do something or to do something. Then I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do because I'm Will Koken and that's the person I am and that's <laughs> yeah. what I'm going to do. Yeah. I was kind of the same way. You know, well, I'm more fun when I drink. Yeah. You know, that's what people tell me. Yeah. Or so you think, but that's that certain group of people, you know, that want that. And there's many of my friends are listening or I, I hope they're listening. <laughs> right. And many of my friends think that I'm more fun drinking. Right. Which at sometimes I probably am more right. fun drinking, you know, but it's at the same time, it's like, sorry, I can't go out and drink this weekend because I'm busy trying to achieve, you know, this, that, or the other. Right. So... You know, I still drink a little bit, whereas I know you've been sober now for some time. Yeah. I just had the day after the Green Bay Marathon was two years, two years without a drink. Yeah. So talk about the day that you quit drinking. Like talk about, talk about That's what, a tough day. what led um, to that. I mean, that this was, whole conversation is tough. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's, this is a hard conversation for me to but have. And right I'm before glad you're this, sharing it. Yeah. Right before this, I was asking Will, um, how many people listen? <laughs> <Because> <laughs> It's, I feel vulnerable talking about it, but I think it's important that I talk about it because I know that there have been people that have made life changes just by listening to this podcast. Dude, absolutely. And, and Christian used the word, I don't know if you got that far in his podcast yet, um, but he used the word vulnerable to explain unbreakable. Yeah. Okay, no, I haven't gotten that far. So, yeah, yeah so. so as you finish listening to right. it uh, today or whatever, yeah, you'll, cool. you'll hear that that's how he describes it. Yeah, that's so how cool I that feel right use, now, yeah. It's cool that you use the word vulnerable. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to talk about the day I quit drinking. I put myself in a situation where I lost the trust of my family. I lost the trust of um, my parents, my brother, my wife, and everybody around me. I lost their trust. Yeah. So, so that's a huge moment. Like I can't yeah. imagine losing. It was the, the trust worst that. I've ever felt in my entire life. Yeah, I believe it. And I remember waking up um, on my couch, and my dad was there, and he basically looked at me and said, "You fucked up." Uh, and I, I said, imagine. "Especially coming from your dad. Your dad's one of the nicest people." I've yeah. Ever met. Um, and I, I said, "I know," and I gotta do something about it. I gotta do something about it now um so i went to my parents house um on my on my harley i thought i was <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what i was thinking because i was probably still a little buzzed up but yeah. um i jumped on my harley went over to my parents and my mom said you're going to aa right now so i um, went home and i had my last drink and so you still had one more drink yet. yeah I, <laughs> I figured it was my last one and so i finished off what i had and uh, jumped in the shower and went to AA. And those people, um, God bless them. Yeah. So I you, hate to say those people. That's not what I mean. The people at that meeting that day, God bless them. Yeah. Because what they said in there still sticks with me. And the genuine concern they had on their face when they looked at me and saw me, it, it was enough for me to say, this is what I got to do. I mean, when you think about it, like probably everybody who's been in AA has gotten to a point where they have wrecked their life, where they have truly, you know, not everybody, but a lot of those people have been in that same spot. Yeah. Where they've lost trust from everybody. Yeah. And the last thing they that, like, their family's giving them one last opportunity. Yeah. And, and so it's up they, to you to do with it. So right. they go there. So those people have got to just welcome you in with complete open arms knowing, hey, and we were here two years ago. Right. Or three years ago, or we were here last week. Right. Like... Yeah, and um, I never went through the whole, you know, the 12 steps. Yeah. Um, I went every day for a while, but um, I just, it's an excuse, but I'm a busy guy. I'm a busy guy yeah. <laughs> these days. So, no, absolutely, um, especially with, with a family. Like yeah, yeah. I got two kids. I work a full-time job, and now I'm training for a run. Yeah. But, um. I, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I have good people around me to, that um, if I say, hey, look, I'm having a tough time right now, um, they talk me off the ledge. Yeah, which is huge. You know, that's the one thing that I tell people is, like, get a support system. Yeah. If you don't have one, find a group. 
because yeah. there's groups for everything out there. Yeah. Just go on Google and there's groups for everything. everything. And I think the main, one of the main things for me was to realize, hey, I'm not alone. Yeah. You know, there's other people out there that, like you said, they're go- they've gone through this. They're going through this and they're going to go, be- I'm going to be dealing with this the rest of my life. Yeah. Your next meeting that you probably went to had somebody new who was at your day right. one and now you're at day two, day right. three or day four or whatever day you were on. And yeah. you got a new person coming in who just wrecked their life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, obviously I don't want to talk about anything in those that was ever said in any of those yeah, meetings it's you know confidential. it's confidential Absolutely. but Absolutely. yeah people at those meetings you know um like i said i can't not say enough yeah i think it's just it's, it's awesome that there's groups out there like that you know there's aa and there's other groups out there that help with that and it's just awesome yeah that they exist and that they're there to to make the process a little bit easier because as soon as and the one thing that i've learned from from this podcast is that it relates to people in some way. And the fact that somebody can see that somebody went out and achieved it makes them believe that it is achievable. That they can do it too. And that's why it was super important as we, Justin and I had numerous conversations leading up to this and he was like, I'm not sure I want to talk about about the alcoholism and being an alcoholic, you know, and the learning disability or that I don't have a story is what you told me a couple of times. Yeah, like, that's how it my feels. My story right? isn't that good, but it's like... No, man, there's so many people out there, especially in the state of Wisconsin, suffering f- from alcoholism. And so many people across the world suffering from learning disabilities and alcoholism. And like to know that people have gone through the process and, and what works and what's out there, it's inspiring. Like yeah. it's inspiring. E- each part of it is is captivating and, expiring and inspiring because it, it relates. You're a normal guy who right. had a normal upbringing mid-class family yep in the midwest like i said i had it pretty good yeah right you know like so when we you know and that's what i love about this platform is that it provides this normal inspiration that's why i told you and anybody out there like if you want to apply the websites on the bottom you can just go on and apply to be on the podcast or if you've got somebody who you think has an awesome story send it my way right that's how we get people on here and I talked Justin into this through running. I was like, come on, man. Like, you've got an awesome story. You need to share your, your awesome story of how you beat learning disability and then beat alcoholism after. Yeah, I don't and think... Um, through life, you know. I'm not sure if I beat it. You know, it's something I... Maybe with the learning disability, you know, I've learned to deal with that. That's fine. Yeah. But I deal with um, alcohol, like, every day. It's on my mind. I think about it every day. You yeah, know, it's just every day. crazy. And it's fine. You know, people um, people always say, well, you can have just one. <laughs> no, you don't get it. <laughs> if yeah. that's what you think, you don't get it. Yeah. So I'm just going to stay away from you. <laughs> no, that, but, yeah, I can't. I can't. I can't have one. Yeah. And I know that. And that's a scary thought. It's a scary thought to think I can never have just another one. drink. Like, for me, I believe that at one point I had all of the traits and characteristics of being an alcoholic. And the only way that I am now able to stay, you know, not an alcoholic or not needing to drink and get blacked out every night of the week, um, because I still, I still drink occasionally is that I have to earn my drinks. So I always told myself, if you want to drink Saturday night, you have to log 50 miles this week and you have to do X amount of homework for college and you have to do X amount at work. And if you don't accomplish, so I would, I would take a notebook and a sheet of paper and I'd write down all these things that I had to accomplish to be able to reward myself with the opportunity to drink on the weekend. Yeah. And if I didn't do that, then I would sit there Saturday night and just stew about not being able to drink, be super pissed off. And I would achieve the rest of my list on Saturday right. night. See, I wouldn't even do that. I'd just blow that list off. <laughs> yeah. And that, th- so that's what I had to do to get myself to quit right. or to get myself to put myself in control of my life again because my life was out of control just like yours was. Yeah. You know, and so it's crazy to me that, because I don't think about alcohol now during the day. I've gotten like past that point finally. But it's crazy to know that two years later, and this is super important for people out there that suffer from alcoholism that have quit like a week ago. You know, so I have, there's somebody in my life that I know, uh, I'm not going to mention any names or or how I know them, but they have gone through detox probably a dozen, two dozen, three dozen times. Um, 
longest they've stayed clean is like a year. But same story as you. Constantly think about alcohol. Can't wait to have the next drink. Right. Um, and they've been clean for a week now. And that's a, and you know to people say, well, you got two years. Yeah. I got and the people are like, well, I got you know three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is. Yeah, start somewhere. Like, that's four weeks. Yeah, it's that's huge. That's four weeks. A day is huge. Right. That's a long time. Yeah. Think yeah. about it. You know, yeah, especially if you're thinking about because two years down the road, if you're still thinking about it every day, like what makes you not? Like how do you not? Because that's what people need to know is like. How, when I'm still drink? thinking about it, do I just say no? It's because I know what road it leads down. Yeah. I know I know where I'll end up. I'll end up losing everything. I'll yeah. lose my family. I'll lose my kids. I'll lose my wife. Yeah. And that's, I can't uh, have that. Dude, that's the that's worst. A, that's everything to me. Yeah. Like your love for your wife is your, is, and, your, and your kids. Your love for your wife and kids are your primary thing in life the thing you care the most about mm -hmm. you would stop because we talk about running races and stuff and we're like hey man let's go run this race let's go run this race you know and then you're like i care about my wife to the point that i need to know that she supports this and supports me and is going to support the journey that it's going to take for me to get there and if she's willing to do that then then i'm going to sign up for this right she was more supportive of this, of this last one than i thought she was going to be <laughs> I was a little surprised too when we said, hey, <laughs> yeah, we're going to yeah. go to Arizona for a race. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, I got, um, it's a lot of support, not just for my wife, but, you know, my family too. Sometimes, most of the time, as you know, I'll get up at 3.30 in the morning. Running is what keeps yeah, me focused. Yeah, on Strava, focused. I love seeing your Strava because you're the yeah. only person who gets a workout in before me all of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's days where it drives me nuts because I'm like, damn. <laughs> yeah, damn, Justin. I get up and I'm like, Justin just logged 10 miles. Yeah. And I only gave myself <laughs> time for six. Right. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, it's uh, running is what keeps me focused. It gives me a goal to achieve, you know, and I know that if I start drinking, I'm not going to hit those goals. Yeah. So talk so, about the running journey, like how you got into running. Well, I ran a marathon um, when I was still drinking. And this is just shows you um, how much it hindered me just as far as a running aspect. Yeah. Uh, my joints were all swollen, you know, when I was training my... My knees were swollen. My hands never were healthy. Like, everything was swollen. I remember I was you always complaining about being in pain and yeah, like you just and couldn't I ran, ever get healthy. I ran like I think it was four four hours and forty five minutes was my first marathon. Yeah, which you know it's great. Yeah, I was, still I was a marathon. Happy with it. I ran a marathon. Yeah, yeah. I'm not taking anything away from it. No, I, but, absolutely. Um, the first marathon I ran after being sober. Um, was it was actually a year to the day. Um, yeah, because you quit the day after Cellcom, right? Well, I or, quit. Uh, I don't remember. It was right around. It was right around. Right around, was right around. Yeah. So um, uh, that next marathon I ran was a three-hour. I shaved an almost, well, over an hour off of yeah. my previous best. Yeah. And then this year you just re-PR'd it. Yeah, I ran a 327, almost 327 flat this year. Yeah. It's just crazy. So that's yeah. just a couple of years of sticking to it. Yeah. Uh, and it, like I said, it keeps me focused. Running keeps me focused. Yeah, dude. And it's huge, man. The fact that like, because there's a lot of people out there that from listening to this podcast have started running and are training for 5Ks and 10Ks. Yeah, keep at and, it. And I, see awesome. their, and I see their numbers. They start out at like a 13, 14 minute mile. Yeah. And I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. Like you got out and you just put down a mile. And they're like, it's so slow compared to yours. And I'm like, so what? I didn't, I didn't get here overnight. Here. This is right. six years yeah. of running right. that got me here. Yeah. Like, yeah, that first it. marathon I ran, I ran when um, Chelsea was pregnant with my oldest son, Oliver. Okay. So, and he's about to turn four. Yeah. So it's been about four years of me running. One year while I was drunk all the time. Yeah. I remember drinking and eating fish fries on Friday nights before a 20 mile run. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> No one needed to show smart. up around twenty the next morning. Yeah, you know, with the running group. But um, yeah. So it keeps me focused. My looking at my two boys, it really uh, that helps too. It helps yeah, there's no way that you would want to stay on course. There's no way that you'd want to give that up. So right. to anybody listening, like, it doesn't matter if you're what you're going through. Like, you can quit, find a reason, and then find a healthy outlet. Like Justin found running. There's a million other There's outlets a ton out of there. You can do. 
just, you know, the one thing I tell people is join a group, they hold you accountable. So like, I love the different running groups because they hold us accountable. I love Strava now because you can hold me accountable and be like, Hey, Will, you're not logging miles. We need to log miles. We've right. got these goals. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's good to be held accountable. Right. Like it's, it's really good. That's what the support system is there for. Yeah. You yeah. got to find what, what you're passionate about. Yeah. And I always, I ran track in high school. Yeah. You were a state champion in high school. No, not Weren't a state you? champion. Oh, okay. No. Uh, I wish. <laughs> Close. Close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Close. I ran against the guy that had the state record. Oh. Um, <laughs> He got it when he was a sophomore, and then broke it when he was a junior. And then I ran against him in the same heat when I was when he was a senior. I was a senior. Damn. But um, yeah, we medaled in two events, two relay events at state. Yeah. But I had the high school, two hundred meter dash record for about ten years. I was gonna say. But yeah. and I always said, why does anybody ever run more than two miles? It's stupid. <laughs> like, it's just dumb. And Don't now do you've it. got what three marathons, four marathons under your belt. Um, More than that, I think six, six marathons. Yeah, yeah I, six. I just think of the Cellcoms, but I forget yeah. that you've done Madison, done the Fox, three Cities. Cellcoms, and I did Madison, and then Fox Cities and Lakefront. I did oh, Milwaukee nice. Lakefront. You did the once. Lakefront. That's yeah. supposed to be an awesome. Marathon. Yeah, it ends. Like the last mile, it's all although downhill. It doesn't, although it doesn't count if you did it one of the years where they missed. Oh, that was the, the Milwaukee <laughs> Marathon. Yeah, I actually oh, I ran one, yeah, yeah. my first half marathon. I ran was last year. Okay. Um, and that was that. It was that race, but the half marathon was thirteen point one. But the nice. the marathon, I think, it was twenty five. Yeah, they fucked something. a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Like if you had a Boston qualifying Qual- time, like, yep. and you tra- you know how hard you train to get a Boston right. qualifying time for ninety percent of people, right. like. I still don't have a Boston qualifying yeah. time. I was on track once to like mile 22 and then blew Blow up. up and ended up having a 340. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's crazy. But. Yeah. So the next thing I want to ask you is like what – define the word unbreakable. What does it mean to you? How do you feel that you've now become unbreakable? Because you're a very unbreakable person. Like when I conversate with you now and we go out and run and stuff like that, like you're unbreakable. There's no doubt in my mind. Yeah, um, I think to me what it means is just how you come out of situations, you know, putting yourself in, not necessarily even putting yourself in a vulnerable, there's that vulnerable word again, but yeah. in a vulnerable situation and um, whether you come out the way you want it or not, it's what you, what do you take out of it. Yeah, it's super cool that you use that vulnerable word. And not having seen that far into, into Christian's episode. Because I know you watch them right when they come out. So everybody, if you guys don't know, we record these like a week and a half to two weeks before they right. air. Um, just so that I have time to make sure that everything's locked in and good. And if I got to bring you back in to fix yeah. it. Because I suck at using all this equipment because it's self-taught. Um, but like to use the same word is, is awesome when you haven't even seen the episode yet. Yeah, no. I think um, if you put yourself in a situation like that and if you fail... What do you take out of it? Yeah. How do you how do you how do you react? You can break, which I think um is what I did a lot when I was drinking. I never learned from anything I did. Yeah. You know, I I was always I I was been thinking about it a lot. I was I think I was always I was always breaking. Yeah, just taking the easy road. Yeah. Cuz the and breaking that road was is the easy road. Like and everybody that was drinking. everybody likes to like I tell people Quitting is easy. Like my buddy Jason and I, we talk about it all the time. Quitting's easy. Hell, sometimes it's even fun. <laughs> like because it's so easy. Yeah. You know? And so, like. But like, that bugs me. I can't quit. Yeah. I can't quit. But you found that now. You hit rock bottom. Yeah. Like that my rock day, bottom. Yeah. That day when, when you wrecked everything with your family, like that was rock bottom. You know, or your, or your rock bottom. I yeah. would assume that had to be your rock bottom in life. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately for a lot of people, their rock bottom is death. Yeah. And, I mean, you could have killed yourself at any time. At any time. You could die or just headed down the same anywhere. route I was going, and I would have ended up there. Yeah. You know, I'm... It might have taken a long time, but I would have got there. Yeah. I know I was super close to to that at one point. Like, my rock bottom was was the rock bottom in in, in my life, and I'll never forget it. But that's exactly it, like that's what makes un- people unbreakable in my eyes is how they climb out of that and using that never quit. Yeah. Like, don't ever quit. Yeah. I think, yeah. Just putting yourself in a f- situation where you're not comfortable or you could fail or you could fail. 
So let's talk. Let's talk about your what's next because that's putting you in a at least at least one of your what's next. Yeah. I don't know one of them. But oh that's man. Definitely I got you lots in of a... them. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that too. It depends on who what's Justin you're asking. I think. Um, yes. Yeah, so let's hear a couple of them. Um, the alcoholic and Justin tomorrow is next. I like. That. I have tomorrow. I, I like have that. today, and I have tomorrow. I can't do anything more than that. I have to make it through to every day without a drink. That's all I have. Because without, without, if I decide to drink again, I lose it all. And without drinking, I can be the best version of myself that I can be. Yeah. I can be, just by not drinking, I can be a better dad. I can be a better son, brother, husband, father, if I didn't say that one yet. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can sit here with you and talk to you. You know, I'm a better friend. All I have is tomorrow and right now. Dude, that's huge. And so to any anybody out there who's an alcoholic or recovering alcoholic, like that's the way you have to look at it. Small goals. I used to think that was a bunch of BS when I, you know, you see these people, a lot of celebrities, you know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think his name, Russell Brand, is that his name? Some comedian. I think, okay, I'm not but sure. anyway, he, he was, he's a recovering, um, addict and he says one day at a time. And I remember seeing that when I first quit and I'm like, man, you're full of shit. One day at a time. I have my whole life. Yeah. I have my whole life. I have to go. What are you talking about? One day at yeah, a time. Yeah. And you're planning on living another 80 years or about 70 years. You Hopefully. Know? Like, let's go for 80. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's get to 115. Like, <laughs> let's rock this shit. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just tomorrow, one day at a time. It's honest to God. It's the truth. Yeah, and that's, that's how it is. That's how it is for me. That's how it's got to be. And sometimes, I've told people this too, sometimes it's not even one day at a time. Sometimes I have to get through half a day. Sometimes I have to, an hour. Yeah. Sometimes i got to make it through those next 10 minutes because I'm. it's that hard at that time. Dude, that's how it's got to be for like quitting smoking for people that smoke. Yeah, is, and I quit that too. Yeah, I you, smoked. Yeah. How many years did you smoke for? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe 10. So let's just say 10 years. Right. Right. Even if it was less, we could even say five years. Right. Completely hooked on nicotine. Right. It was mostly when I drank, but which to, was most yeah, of the time. But anyway, you had to quit it the same way, right? Yeah. Cold turkey. One day yeah. at a time. One hour at a time. Yeah. One minute it's at a time. Thing. You got to relearn. You got to relearn everything. So nice. yeah, the alcoholic and Justin says tomorrow's next, and then um, after that, I've got the High Cliff 50K coming up. Nice, um, August 4th. New run for those of you that don't know who puts it on, right? That's a new run one, isn't it? By uh, yeah, yeah, but Mark, Mark puts that on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. So sign up if you guys haven't signed up. Yeah, Mark's a good dude. I signed up for uh, yeah, I signed up for that. I feel like I'm not training properly for it. <laughs> Dude, I just, but, just uh, did 16 miles at Baird's Creek on the or at High Cliff. High Cliff, trails. yeah. I think you'll be okay. Yeah, so I'm sure it hurt a little because we're. Oh both yeah, I was hurting. If Shannon <laughs> listens to this, he kicked my ass. He made me run up a ski hill. <laughs> just tell him to break another rib. <laughs> yeah. Slow that old man down. All right. <laughs> but um, yeah. So then I got High Cl- High Cliff. Um, before that though, I'm gonna go see my friend that I was talking about in England. Yeah. Um. And then I'll come. I got high cliff. All of this is going on while I'm taking two classes. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So, Plus raising a family and working a full time job. Yeah, you just got to do it, dude. And just that's what I tell people: it. there's more time in the day. Sleep less. And you talk about support systems. Talk about my family because they're the ones watching my kids while I, yeah, while I do schoolwork. Yeah. While you're grinding, just trying to make yourself better and set a better example for your. Otherwise, kids. I'd be running after work. <laughs> Logging Instead of three thirty in the morning, logging them miles. But um, yeah. Then I got I got High Cliff. Um, there's another one I want to sign up for. I want to sign up for a fifty miler. Yep. Um, are you and Chad going to do that one that we talked about a little bit? Uh, he still needs, as Shannon would say, he still needs clearance from the tower. Uh, <laughs> Chad, make your wife listen to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll call him out. Um, <laughs> Chad, you've been called out. <laughs> yeah. So he's got. We're trying to get, I'm trying to talk him into that glacial trail. Yeah. Um, on the Ice Age Trail. It's a yeah, 50 I wish mile. I could make that thing work. Yeah. That's, that's going to be think a it's sweet gonna be a good race. One. That's going to be a sweet be a good race. One. Um, and then I graduate in December. Well, I'm nice. done with classes. I don't walk. I'm not, I think I don't walk till May. Okay. But, um, yeah, yeah. 
I'm not. I'm. I don't think I'm gonna go. But really, yeah. I told just myself me downplaying I, it again. I told myself when I graduate, there is no way that I'm not walking across <laughs> the stage. I mean, I've earned every inch of yeah. this degree. I'm walking across the stage. <laughs> I, yeah. I will be when I graduate. I'll, should be 34 because I right. think I'm going to graduate I'll this be December. I'll be 34, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to graduate this December as well nice. from GB. And I and I told the wife already, I was like, I'm walking across the stage and I'm having a party. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm going to do any of that. graduation cake. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do any of that. Um, yeah. But that's just me. No, and that's, um, and that's that humbleness right there. Like, yeah. For me, like, I want them to hand me the diploma. Like, I want them to hand it to me. Yeah. I don't want to get it in the yeah. mail. I want to, like, Grip it from the yeah. I'll probably get like, in the mail, and throw it in the drawer. Yeah, and that's what I'll do when I get home. Like I'm not gonna, <laughs> right, right. gonna put it anywhere. Right. I'm gonna file it, toss it on my resume for yeah, when I yeah. retire from the army. But I'm like, I want the dean or whoever is handing that out yeah. to, to hand it to me because I'm like, I earn this. Like, if I could get that old guidance counselor to hand it to me on stage, dude, that would be then sick. I'd walk. <laughs> that would be that would be sick. That'd be the only way I think I'd do it. <laughs> like. <laughs> Can you read it for me quick before you hand right, it to me? Yeah, see, tell me what that says. Yeah, tell right. me I couldn't get into college, yeah. and I would have a post-it note inside of it that says, <laughs> yeah. college what? Yeah. Um, so then college, and then um, in March, on hopefully on the day of my birthday, on the 10th, I'll be finishing a 100-miler yeah. with you. Yeah, that's going to be wild. Yeah. Like, I am excited. I'm pretty nervous about the rattlesnakes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was rattlesnakes <laughs> yeah. till today. Like hour and a half ago, right. you're like, "Hey, man, I was just looking up the wildlife down at the Antelope Canyon, hundred, and they, they have just put a warning out for it on their Facebook. Yeah, like, watch out for rattlesnakes if you're running right now out there. Like, I don't Damn. do rattlesnakes, bro. If I <laughs> yeah. hear a rattle, like I'm turning around. Like, yeah, I'll finish that hundred in no time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or I'm gonna tap out. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, that's not an option. No, it's not at all, dude. I'm I'm super excited. Like I've the one thing through like this unbreakable podcast and like talking to everybody about things, it, it's creating this like pursuit to find what, what will break me. Like I'm excited to see if the hundred miler can break me. I don't think it will. Like, and I don't think it's going to break you either. Like you've been through, you've been through too much now, you know, with quitting drinking and all that stuff that like being out there and experiencing it, I don't think there's any way we quit because we can just look back at the lower points in our lives and be like, this ain't shit. Yeah. I think, um, I think though, even just watching you go through your world record attempt, you got to put in the work as far as not just the miles you log, but the nutrition, you know, yeah. obviously the nutrition. It's so huge, you got to teach yourself, you got to train your mind and your body. There's a lot that's going to go into this. Yeah, I'm excited. How There's do you feel about how do you feel this. about nutrition going in? Like oh, man, having my nutrition's like being, garbage right now. Being and you're a graduate of culinary school, yeah. so like you understand food, all of the components to food. Yeah, and your nutrition's garbage. It's hard. Like, do it's you do hard. any? Are you on any sort of diet? Because like I was doing the keto diet for the world record. Yeah. Um. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I need to. Well, I I intermittent fast. So and that's supposed to be probably super good five for you. or six days a week. Really? Yeah, and that's so how long do you intermittent fast for? Sixteen hours. Damn. Yeah, and I don't really know what it does to be honest. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I love but it's food, good. Justin. I yeah. love food. That's my problem is I love food. So I found a diet that's like good for me, but allows me to eat as much as I want. Right. So like being in ketosis, I can eat as much as I want as long as I'm only consuming fat. Those things. That you and can so, consume, right. But I can eat as much of it as I want. So I'll put down like 5,000 calories in a day. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, my God, that's <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I do that. Um, what I think it does more than anything for me is um, ever since I quit drinking, yeah, sugar, all I want to eat is sugar. Really? Yeah. Because well, think about all the sugar and alcohol. Yeah. So you're like, I'm can't a wait sugar to fiend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get enough of it. <laughs> that um, makes sense, though. Yeah. So, what it does intermittent fasting, I'm finding, is doing for me is it's keeping me from eating um, every day at work, almost every day at work. What a, a couple things that are left over from the bakery from the day before, and uh, put them out on the counter. Today there's a plate full of brownies. Yeah. I had to walk past it all day long. Man, that's good. It's, it's training me to stay away from those, some of those sugars. Yeah, well, and you especially already, early in the early in the morning. And you've built that mental strength already to not drink, 
not smoke. So like staying away from a brownie's got to be easier than yeah. one of those two. I yeah. think you know it's pretty tough. <laughs> I believe it. I, believe, I don't stay um, away from a brownie. I'll tell right? you that. Like, <laughs> Another thing, I, yeah, I don't do is I don't drink any caffeine. That was hard to quit too. I I quit that probably seven years ago. Right. And now I occasionally have it. Yeah, once in a while I have a soda or something, but yeah. And every once and again, I give myself like two Red Bulls a year. Yeah. Because I'm just like. <laughs> yeah. Unless unless yeah. I'm like having them with a drink or something, right. you know. But oh fuck it, off the wall. Yeah, like can of Red Bull. Sure. I'm fired up for like four hours. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the last time I had one of those. I'm probably gonna have one. I'd be up during, for days. I'm probably I'm gonna sure have one it. during the hundred. Oh, I'm gonna like, be drinking all the Coca Cola I can find. Yeah, like mile eighty, I'm gonna be like Red Bull. <laughs> 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 Here I come. Yeah. You know, and like it's funny because you talk to like Tommy Byrne, and he's like, "Yeah, just Mountain Dew." <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that guy does it. Yeah, do I mean he's crazy? Yeah, but I love but, running with him. Yeah, so yeah, that's about it. I got uh, the hundred miler. That's probably, I think, the icing on the cake for right now. Yeah, and then we're gonna have to figure out what's after that. So, everybody knows when we get to this hundred miler, I'm bringing a portable podcast setup down to Antelope Canyon, and we're gonna hang out and bullshit about the hundred miler, just like I did the world record the day before, and then. Um, some of the pacer crew that we have with us, I'm going to hook them up with some GoPros during the pacing to get some footage that we'll include yeah, right in the on. middle cool. of what's going on at like yeah. mile 25 for each of us, mile 50, you know, and to include the people doing, because we've got a huge group going down with us. we got yeah. like 14 people going down. That's going to be awesome. Most of which have been inspired by this. Yeah. To go down and, and sign up for it. So we got like Mech Iagos, who's now signed up for a try um, with his girlfriend, Kristen. And they're going down, and they're going to run, and it sounds like they're upgrading to the 55K. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, 35 miles Jeez. instead of doing the half marathon. Right. So, Matt, we're calling you out right now. Sign <laughs> yeah, up for the 55K. Yeah. Um, but we've got guys signing up for the 50-miler. You know, my wife's doing the 55K. That'll be her first. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know, you know all that. So, that, so I knew people were running, but I didn't know. And they're all planning on coming out after they get done with the 55K, and we're like mile 70 plus, and coming out and helping pace whoever needs whoever needs help pacing. We're gonna need all the help. So, yeah. so the podcast with that'll have recordings from everybody, you know, before, during, and after each of their races. Um, all compiled into one or two episodes that I think are going to be super cool and like a lot of good takeaway because we'll get all of us at like mile 25 like yeah life's good we've trained yeah, this feeling far. great <laughs> mile 50 you know and it's much like the world record one where it was like when I got to mile like 24 and I was in that recording or 25 whatever it was and I was like I'm in pain yeah this is miserable like I can't wait to be there again it was the most I can't rewarding. wait to be there again. It's the most rewarding moment in your life. I saw like, you at mile, I think, when did I see you? I, uh, I think it was 23 like 20, and a half, 23 or something. Dude, yeah. It was such a pick-me-up to hear that you PR'd. Yeah. Like, it was a real pick-me-up. It lasted great for like two minutes, and then it was back down <laughs> yeah. into the misery hole. Yeah, everybody had a good day that day. It was Dude, a great day. The weather worked out perfect yeah. for us. Like, hopefully Antelope Canyon, same thing, like hopefully. good weather. We got to train here in the winter, which is going to be miserable. That's going to be hard. Dude, it's going to be real hard. I haven't quite figured out how I want to. I don't know how I'm going to approach that either. Four, five, six up. hour, six hour running days. Like, yeah. Do you break it down and run three in the morning, three in the evening? I think that's what two, I'm going to have to do. Two, and two somehow during the day. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to have to do is break it down somehow. Right. And you and I will be logging all these miles together by then, yeah. I'm sure. So, Jason's training all by himself, right? Yeah. He's out in California. Out in Cali, but he's coming back in like two weeks. All right. So he's going to start logging some miles with us. Cool. Um, and him and I today were talking about some more stupid stuff. Uh, we're looking at even after Antelope Canyon, like, what do we want to do after this? And we both know, like, if we don't achieve it, we go and we find another 100-miler and we do it until we until we achieve it. Um, it's, there's no option. You're the same way. We will repeat the same race until it's achieved. Yeah, I better just get it done. So that's my wife, I don't think, is going to put up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's what I told myself at the world record. I was like, if I don't get this done, I got to do another marathon right. with 100 pounds on my back. I'm not doing another marathon <laughs> with 100 <laughs> pounds on my back. I don't blame you. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, you got anything else you want to you wanna tell the world besides uh, the main thing I think, the main takeaway that I, that I want to push out again is like if you're addicted to something and you want to stop. You can change. You can change, and you got to do it one minute at a time, one hour at a time, 
one day at a time. And once you get to one day at a time, live one day at a time. And if you ever got to go back to one minute, you go back to one minute. And I think that's the biggest takeaway yeah. from this episode. Yeah, there's people too, you know. I think the one thing I would like to say, um, there's, there is help out there. You just got to go find it. Yeah, and it's not hard. It's to not find. hard to find. Not with not with this device. Like, are right. you kidding me? Yeah, it's not hard to find. Yeah, I mean, it's there, and it's a lot of it is free. A lot of it can cost money, but too, I mean, if you've got a job, you got benefits. Look into your benefits. Yeah, there might be program out there that with your employer that helps you because they want you the best you they can get too. Yeah, they're invested in you. I didn't even think about that. If I was an employer, I would absolutely offer something that would improve my employees' work quality. Right. And you know, if you're showing up to work drunk, you're not producing the work quality that you should. Right. Like, so yeah, as an employer, that's a no brainer. If yeah. you're an employer and you're not offering that, you should show up to work tomorrow and be like, hey. Anybody suffering from this, that, or the other? They're like, I'm gonna, We're gonna come up, up with something. Yeah. I'm gonna hook you up so that I get more production out of you right. the same eight-hour yeah. workday. Like, why yeah. wouldn't you want that? There's options out there. Yeah. There's lots of them, and you're not alone. I think that's the main thing. You are not alone. There's other people Absolutely. out there that Absolutely. feel the same way, have gone through the same things, and they're willing to help. And I think um, you just gotta just gotta want it for yourself more than anyone else. Yeah, that's a fact, man. You gotta yeah, want to quit. A fact. You got to want to quit for you because, like I said before, um, by focusing on myself, I can be a better everything else. I'm a better friend, husband, father, son, brother. Yeah. And that's the, the big thing is, like, you got to want to do it yourself. Nobody can keep you clean. They can help you get clean. Right. But you got to want to be clean yep. to stay clean. Yeah. Like, do it for the people around you but you got to want it yourself. For yourself, absolutely. Awesome, Justin. Well, right, thanks man. for Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks Appreciate for coming it. on the show, man. Yeah, of course. Everybody else out there, stay unbreakable, uh, and we'll see who's next week. So stay unbreakable. Thanks, everybody. We're out.